Hello everyone. I hope your week is off to a good start. We're going to continue with lectures on journalism and news media and today we're going to discuss the business aspect of news. So I'm going to share my screen with you now and I just want to tell you at the beginning that this time I have like a few questions that you're going to need to answer and then post your answers on Blackboard. So pay attention to this lecture because I'm literally going to just throw in the questions that you will need to answer. So why don't we start with a simple question, which maybe is not so simple. What is the number of employees in the U.S. who work as news analysts, reporters, and journalists? What do you think? On average, how much money do they earn hourly? So this is not, uh, these are not the questions that you're supposed to answer to. This is not part of your exercise. I just wanted you to think about this for a minute and make a guess. What do you think is the number of employees in the US? I have those numbers prepared for you. Let's take a look at US Bureau of Labor Statistics and their data. According to them, there were about 44,100 people in May 2019 whose job was to narrate or write news stories, reviews, or commentary for print, broadcast, or other communications media, such as newspapers, magazines, radio, or television. Their mean hourly wage was $30. If you look at the table I provided from the U.S. Bureau of Statistics website, you can see that there's some good news for you because New York City had 6,020 journalists. So this is New York is the state with the highest employment level in our occupation. There were 6,020 people employed and then, but if you look at the employment per thousand jobs, it is interesting that um, District of, of Columbia has the greatest number. Why, what do you think is the reason for this? Why is it that DC has the highest employment level when it comes to employment per thousand jobs? I'm sure you know the answer to these questions. So just wanted to provide this data at the beginning of the last lecture and what we're going to talk about is who is it that journalists work for and I want you to think about it for a second. Uh, I do journalism but who is it that I work for? Do I work for my news organization? Do, am I responsible to my boss? Am I responsible to my editor? Am I responsible to myself, to my family members? Who is it that I'm um, responsible to? Who, who is it that I should keep in mind when I produce journalism stories. Journalists report information to the public and their duty is to the public. But how do we evaluate if they are doing a good job? Let's take a look at the past. For a long time, journalists were evaluated based on the quality of their work. What does it mean? What kind of stories you produce, how many stories do you produce, what is the impact of your stories on um, overall population, on, on trends, on events, etc. But at the end of the 20th century, this focus in the media industry shifted to efficiency and profit. What appeared to be the most important with, with respect to evaluating journalism was the profitability of the news enterprise rather than the quality of the content produced. What does it mean? By 2000, America's journalistic leaders had been transformed into business people spending a third of their time at work not on journalism, but on business matters. And I can tell you that in the past 20 years, uh, this has been even more evident. And I recently conducted a study about business models in diverse news organizations in the United States. And I learned that it now is not just journalistic leaders, not just editor and management of news organizations, but also journalists need to be 
or are involved in some ways in, new, in the newsroom business. What kind of impact um, would such a focus have on audiences? Well, basically because the focus um, of news organizations became pro their profit, the public started perceiving the news more as a business and less as a public service. Those who were responsible for the quality of news became responsible for the profit of the news organization. So now suddenly editors need to think about the profit of news organization, not just on news organizations, not just the content that will be delivered to a wider population. And now, this is my first question for you. So as I mentioned, I will have a few questions for you and then at the end you will write your answers and post them on Blackboard. So my first question is, I want you to think about how does this focus on profit affect the work of news organization? What kind of impact does such a focus have on democracy? So use readings that, that I provided, a look at the textbook and also, watch this video before you start writing your answers to this question. Now, loyalty to citizens. Whatever the motive of those who produce news is, it can be profit or prestige, their focus should be on loyalty. As Kovac and Rosen still pointed, journalists' first loyalty is to citizens. They produce their work for the public. So when I mention profit or, or uh, what, what, what basically does it mean? So your motive to produce a new story can be, oh, I want to contribute. I want to make sure that my news organization is stable enough. I want to make sure that my boss is not going to criticize me because my news stories are not attracting enough audiences and I'm not going to um, turn this story into a profitable one. Or I just care about being this famous journalist, I want to make sure that everyone knows me, I want to be popular. So that can be your motive. And that is absolutely okay. But you need to keep in mind that the first thing is your loyalty to citizens. You need to keep in mind that as a journalist, you're doing this public service and that you're producing your stories for the public. I want to go back for a moment to history and see uh, what kind of perception of journalism, uh, of journalism was present in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So at the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, publishers started insisting on stepping away from sensationalism pursued by William Randall Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. And you remember from our previous lecture that these two guys, Joseph Pulitzer and Randall Hearst, they were uh, the pioneers of yellow journalism, journalism packed with sensationalism, but still they were, um, they, they're probably most, some of the most prominent figures in journalism um, in, in the history of this profession. So why is it that other journalists decided to step away from this form of writing, which is tablet writing basically? Why is it that they wanted to emphasize um, other aspects of journalism? Why is it that they wanted to emphasize accuracy? Why is it that they wanted to emphasize the democratic portion of journalism? So the reason for that is that they wanted to make sure the audiences understand that they're doing this public service. Their loyalty is to them. So in, 19, in 1896, for instance, in the end of the uh, 19th century, publisher Adolf Oaks, both the New York Times, promising more tasteful and accurate style, style journalism. So even though Hearst and Pulitzer played very important role in journalism at that time in the 19th century. Still, 
there was this shift and other news owners and um, other newspaper leaders wanted to make sure that the audience is getting more tasteful, not sensational, but more tasteful and accurate journalism. Kovac and Rosenstiel described this move um, as the move of Adolf Oaks as the most famous declaration of intellectual and financial independence in journalism. So to, to be able to deliver accurate and tasteful news to a wider population, you need to demonstrate intellectual and financial independence from everyone. There is a similar, um, A similar statement, in a way, came from Eugene Meyer. After he bought the Washington Post in 1933, he crafted a set of principles that, stating, that stated, among other items, in pursuit of the truth that the newspaper shall be prepared to make sacrifices of its material fortunes if such a course be necessary for the public good. So you can see here that they really insisted that it's not about the money, the news production is about the public good. It is about the citizens. It is not about the financial aspect of the media. That was at the beginning of the 20th century later in the 1980s and 1990s, before the internet entered the newsroom, media workers started being occupied with the idea of independence, but in a different way. Not just in an independence, um, uh, intellectual or financial independence, but they became independent to the extent that they started turning themselves into isolation. So you can be independent, but you shouldn't uh, really shift to the point where you're isolating yourself from the community, where you're isolating yourself from those that you are covering just to demonstrate that you're really independent in your work. Why is it so? Journalists, um, of, uh, so let's, let's, let's see what actually happened. As journalists tried to protect their independence then, they were to a certain extent being pushed to disengagement from the community. Educated journalists would come from other places to work for a news organization and they would be less involved in the community. So you can see that um, you can be independent and work in your community as a journalist by making sure that you are delivering the news in a non-biased manner, that you are delivering accurate stories, that you're delivering accurate information, that you're making sure to cover all sides of the story be, be, before you deliver that story to your audience. And even if you're working in a community where somebody might get angry because of what you wrote, you still need to demonstrate that independence. But you also need to make sure that you're engaged within the community. And the problem with these people who are just moving from one state to work in a news organization somewhere else where they didn't know the community that well, when you move like that, you don't, you don't, if you don't understand the community well, it is likely that your story stories would not be put in appropriate context or that they will lack some information that is important for everyone to understand what is happening at the, at the community level. So this tone, this change of tone in journalism also contributed to isolation. What, is, what does this mean? So one of the things that contributed to isolation was journalists not working in their communities, but working in other communities that they were not familiar with. So they just wanted to be independent. They wanted to stay away. But actually, in journalism, it is really important to build network connections, strong network, and to show that you have understanding of the people, the situation, and the place where you work. Um, but there was another thing. So they started pro uh, producing stories that were cynical in a way, subjective and judgmental. They started stepping away from politicians instead of, for instance, um, explaining what, the what a politician said. They were more 
focused on their motives, what they were saying, and other things. So they were interpreting more than delivering facts. So they focused on interpretation rather, rather than information collection and distribution. The number of straight news, so the number, when I say straight news, that's collecting information, just putting that, them into context, but without like providing this enormous interpretation. And this type of straight news was decreasing in the 80s and 90s while the number of interpretive and analytical stories was growing. So this cynicism in journalism was at what, what was happening at the same time was a business strategy at many newspaper and later, later television stations to enhance profit by going after not the largest but the most affluent audiences. So let me just try to wrap this in, in, in one sentence or two. Basically, journalists in the 80s and 90s started inter interpreting more, more news and providing commentaries rather than straight news stories. So they focused on interpretation rather than on straight facts. They, they started focusing more. And this led them to isolation. They started thinking more about um, how, how am I going to analyze this, this event? Um, and they focused a lot on critique, which isolated them from the people they were critiquing and also from the audience, but at the same time, what was happening is that newspapers wanted to make sure that they're earning money, so they focused not on um, having as many people as they can to read their news stories, but they focused on rich areas. They decided to limit their circulation to rich areas. At the same time, Television focused on producing news that targeted women, 18 to 49, who made purchasing decisions in households. Why, why is this, why, what is the reason for this? So just remember, uh, when we look at newspapers and why they decided to limit circulation to rich areas, just, so just remember that main revenue um, in every news organization is advertising. So they need to focus on those areas, just like television focused on women because they wanted to make sure that they're still um, gaining revenue from ad ads. And of course, if you focus on the population that buy stuff, then you're likely to attract more advertisers. However, this trend did not go without consequences. In the early 1990s, the industry suffered a drop in advertising. So you thought this business strategy would work, but then after a while, um, suddenly you face this drop in advertising and advertising was the main component of financing news production. Again, it is the main source of revenue. And I'll also discuss that as source of revenue later in this lecture when I touch upon news media and the in digital age. Now let's take a look at the beginning of the 21st century. Between 2006 and 2012, daily print circulation in the US fell 17%. The financial side suffered even more. Advertising revenue between 2005 and 2013 fell more than 55%. What was the main problem? The problem was that advertising dollars did not migrate to the web along with readers. This advertising loss has a negative effect on news gathering power. And here is where I have my second question for you today. How is it that we should evaluate if journalism is serving its purpose, producing work for the public? You see that for now, as if we look at journalism and we see how throughout um, history, their focus was shifting from, oh, let's be independent and make sure that no one has impact on our reporting to, oh, we need to think about how are we going to um, write stories that will attract more advertisers, that will bring us more money, and then th this means that um, 
news production has turned into business. So I want you to think about this for a second and, uh, and answer this question. How should we allow it if journalism is serving its purpose? So just because they're focusing on business does it mean that journalism is not serving its purpose? Can, you, can your motive be profit, but if, even if your motive, your uh, motive, main motive is profit, does it mean that you can still put the citizen first? The total number of words for both questions one and two should be from 220 to 250. Post your answer to both questions on Blackboard under loyalty to citizens. Just write like um, question number one, question number two, and then explain each and the total number of words should be 20, 20, uh, 220 to 250 words. I also have one more exercise for you, so please keep watching this video. I wanted to also touch upon economic crisis. So you saw how like this, there was this circulation drop uh, from 2006 to 2012, but there is one more thing that happened and we had global economic crisis in 2007, 2008, and it was basically still present in 2009, and news organizations were not spared from this crisis. They faced cuts in revenue and had to reduce their stuff. I don't know if you remember this, but basically journalists across the globe were losing their jobs because news media were not able to support their newsroom operations to the extent um, to which they were able to until the point that when economic crisis emerged. That was also the time when news media were moving to digital platforms and started incorporating social media in their newsroom routine. During this time, media organizations did not diversify their revenue streams and they simply just continue relying on advertising, which as we saw, started dropping in the 90s. What is the latest development? Um, in recent year, the impact of the web on journalism is clear. But does it mean that newspapers or news media are not producing quality journalism? It actually does not. If you look at mainstream media, they preserved quality journalism. See the New York Times website or The Guardian, or you can look at the Washington Post. If we see what's happening there, and if we look at their digital platform, it will be clear to us that these media organizations are actually uh, really trying to do their best to utilize all resources that they can utilize from digital, um, all digital tools to produce news content that is trustworthy, that is, cool, that is really invaluable. What, 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 what does it mean to have this web impact on journalism? Does it mean that other news organizations, if they're not mainstream news organizations, does it mean that they cannot produce quality journalism? No, it does not. There are many local news organizations that are also producing good journalism. And we'll touch upon how do they find revenues to keep their newsrooms running? In, after 2010, one of the things that newspapers started doing was they started charging for their online content. So even though advertising was the primary source of revenue, and it still is, they also wanted to figure out how to charge for the online content. They were selling newspapers, so circulations dropped, and then suddenly people started reading news online for free. And then you think, so why should I buy a newspaper if I can just find this information that I need for free online. For that reason, newspapers started charging for their digital content. And now there are different types of paywalls that news organizations have. Um, like some of them would allow you to just read three articles and then proceed. Uh, if you want to proceed and read more, you just need to make sure to subscribe to that news media platform. 
or you can get some news for free while um, those feature stories or op ads and other uh, type of content that is exclusive in a way uh, for that news organization, you need to pay for it. If you want to get this premium content, then you will need to pay for it. Pay for it. Even though news organizations are looking at other forms of revenues, advertising remains the primary source of revenue for news organizations. So their focus is to attract more advertisers. And I uh, did this research recently where I discovered that news organization, local news organization in the US rely primarily still rely primarily on advertising 80 to 90 percent of their revenue comes from ads now there is one positive thing and that is that um, news organizations are today uh, connecting in a better way with citizens with their readers they're using social media to promote their content to gather the news to connect with the readers and why is this important this connection with readers can also bring some money into the news organization without making news organizations um, forget about their primary purpose and their loyalty, which is loyal to the citizens. How, uh, how is this possible? Well, there are other sources of revenue that news organizations can rely on, and um, some of them include reader donations, memberships, organizing events, and you know, various types of sponsorships. So what does this mean? Um, you can ask readers to donate money to your news organization and support journalism that you're producing. And this way you, um, you can build stronger connections with your readers and you can demonstrate that you're really working for them. You're not working for, anyone else, you're not working for the government, you're not working for big companies, you're just working for your readers and you can openly invite them to support your journalism if you believe that um, this is a way for you to keep producing quality work and also that you're, uh, you're not sponsoring that work but that you're actually uh, getting this money that can cover your expenses, the expenses that your newsroom has. Memberships also, that's one form of a revenue. So instead of posing a paywall, some news organizations allow people or invite people to become their members. So as members, they donate some money, but they can also have certain benefits with respect to um, the news consumption on that website. Some news organization would decide to give readers subscription or membership if they pay some money, but then readers will get content um, that is ad free. And finally, how can a news company remain committed to citizens under these circumstances? First of all, the owner must be committed to citizen first. So we live in the era where money is important and maybe we can say that news had turned into business on one hand, but then on the other hand, you can still, even in, if you pursue that profit, you can still remain loyal to your citizens. But how is that possible? So there has to be loyalty to citizens at several levels, not just at the level of a journalist himself or herself. The owner must be committed to citizens first. Also, hire business managers who also put citizens first. So you see that there's actually this loyalty at several levels. Journalists have final say over news. So it's not a manager who's gonna come and say, look, I don't think we should publish this because you know maybe we will lose this advertiser. If journalists believe that that news story is really important, they need to pursue that story. Set and communicate clear standards internally. State what the mission of your news organization is. State what your standards are. And make sure that the public also understands the standard. 
events. So I, um, I share this advice and this advice come, um, comes from the textbook. So I want you to keep reading it and also I have another exercise for you. That is why I wanted you to stay with me until the end of this lecture. That is exercise two. It is separate from the first one I gave you. What I want you to do is reflect on the essay. It was your homework, The Source of Bad Writing by Steven Pinker. Explain the author's main arguments, state the reasons why journalists need to write in a simple way, write about 150 words, and post a reflection on Blackboard under the source of bad writing. I think this is a good example that shows, it touches upon writing, which is, you, you, you think in a way it is not related to journalism business, but if you think about it, um, more, you will see that it's actually, it actually goes back to the point that we had at the beginning of the lecture and at the end of the lecture that our what it is to citizens, that we need to think about citizens. So tell me, why is it that Pinker thinks you need to write in a simple way and what kind of arguments he brought up to prove his point? And this is the reference, so keep reading the textbook. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you'll have um, enjoy the rest of the week and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.